please keep your mics on. Please, please keep your mics on mute so as to avoid any background noise, um, so it doesn't disturb our speaker. Um, we welcome any questions, but please use the chat function and prefix them with a capital Q. So, um, without any further ado, uh, uh, over to you, Laura, please. Hello, evening, everybody. So thank you so much for everyone joining me this evening. I um, really appreciate you taking time out of your, your busy diaries to come and listen to me waffle on this evening. Um, I am going to give you a bit of a whistle stop tour through women in safety and um, diversity and inclusion in a bit more detail. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Laura Orcott. I'm an associate director at HSE Recruitment. Um, women in safety, and diversity and inclusion in general is something that I'm super, super passionate about and have been for a number of years. Um, I've been involved in the UK Women in Safety Group, um, and I'm also uh, a committee member of One Wish. For those of you that don't know what One Wish is, it's the Global Coalition of Women in Safety Networks. Um, and the aim of One Wish is to promote inclusion throughout safety throughout the world. So a really, really great group to be a part of. Um, so diversity and inclusion uh, has been the center of a number of conversations for quite a while now um, and for you know, really good reason but i do understand it can be a contentious topic um, oftentimes when i speak about diversity or women in safety particularly on social media um, there can be some backlash from it um, you know we do sometimes get accused of positive discrimination um, and you know, men in particular can feel quite left out of the conversation. And that's just not at all the aim of what we're trying to do here. Um, it's really, really important that everybody, no matter what sex you are, um, you know, what ethnicity you are, what sexuality you are, we all get involved in these conversations. Um, and you all understand why it's such an important topic um, and how it's 100% not meant to rid the workforce of every white man in existence. I promise you <laughs> that is not what we're trying to do here. Um, so to try and help with some of these conversations, there's a few key things that I want to go over this evening. Like I said, it is a bit of a whistle stop tour. You could talk about this stuff for days. Um, but if you do have questions, uh, you know, as Alan said, please do drop them in the chat. I'm happy to, to go to whatever you want to talk about at the end. So today, the sort of stuff that I wanted to go through in regards to women in health and safety uh, was just number one, what are the facts? What is the situation in regards to women in safety at the moment? Secondly, why do we care? <laughs> why is it even important that we have these discussions? Three, how do we make sure we're hiring fairly and we're helping you know, more women get into the industry? Uh, four, what sort of issues do we face internally in companies? What sort of stuff are we coming up against? And five, what sort of things do we put on ourselves? So starting off, what are the facts about women in safety? So to find out, um, I undertook a study recently across 500 business leaders within health and safety to ask them what their opinion was on the situation. Uh, because if you know me, you know I like facts, I like to back my stuff up that we're talking about. So the, one of the first things that came out was almost two thirds of the survey respondents felt that there definitely was a gender imbalance in the health and safety industry. Now, personally, I don't find that particularly surprising. Um, anecdotally, just from working in the industry and you know, based on various other studies and things that have gone on over the years, we know that really it's it's less than a third of industry professionals that are women at the moment. Um, so this just kind of backs it up that you know, most people can see there is a gender imbalance at the moment. But what I thought was quite interesting, one of the other questions we asked was, do we feel that there's a fair level of female representation at senior level currently? Um, and only 18% of our respondents thought that the level of gender representation at senior level was fair at the moment almost 40%, or in fact, slightly over 40%, thought that the representation was skewed and there was a lot of work to do on it. So some interesting stuff came out of this study. Um, it's a really, really good report. It's much more in depth than this. So if anybody does want a copy of this report, all my contact details are at the end and you can just drop me a message and I'll, I'll send it across to you so you can read it in a bit more detail. 
So those are just some of the basic facts. You know, we can see that there is an imbalance. We can see there's definitely imbalance at the top of the tree. But why do we care? <laughs> you know, a lot of people say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, why do we need to meddle? Why do we need to change what we're doing? Um, unfortunately, I am here to tell you that it is broken. So <laughs> that, is, that is why we need to fix it. Um, as I said, I love to back up what I'm talking about with, with surveys and reports. So I've got two here that I'm going to discuss. Again, I can send you these links afterwards if you're interested. But the top link there um, is for a study from McKinsey and Co that they did back in 2019. Um, and what this study found was that companies that were in the top quartile for gender diversity at their executive level were actually 25% more profitable than other companies. So that's already quite a big difference. And actually what was really interesting is they found that the greater the representation at board level, the greater the profit. So that's a really, really interesting fact that I saw on you know, why we should care about it. Um, and what's even more interesting is that these numbers actually only increase when you step away from just gender diversity and include things like ethnic diversity and sexual diversity and all of that stuff. So uh, they actually found that companies with a more ethnically diverse board, that increased profitability by 36%. So these are some really big numbers we're talking about here. Um, so even if your company doesn't want to consider the moral uh, obligations of equality and diversity and inclusion, they absolutely cannot ignore the fact that it makes commercial sense. You know, this is the way that we have to be going now. Um, the bottom line is really, if your company wants to still be in business in 10 years and still be profitable and still be, you know, outranking their competitors, you have to look at your diversity and inclusion. That's just the bottom line of this. And um, really, when you think about it, to me, that seems quite obvious, because say you've got a board that is made up of 10 people that are all from the same background, all from the same culture, all the same sex, they tend to have the same perspective on things, and they come up with the same ideas. So if you are looking to, you know, be cutting edge and have really fresh perspectives, um, you know, that's something that diverse hires are really, really going to help you with. They're going to give you different angles on things and come at things from a, from a different point of view. So when we think about that in relation to the health and safety industry, we know the health and safety industry has been male dominated for, for quite a while. Um, but we also know there's a huge skill shortage in the safety industry at the moment. There are more professionals retiring and leaving the industry than we can attract currently. And that's going to leave us with a massive, massive skills gap. So it's absolutely imperative that we make the safety industry as attractive to, you know, women, LGBTQA, various different ethnicities. We need to make it attractive to everybody if we've got any hope at all of plugging that skills gap that I guarantee you is, is coming. <laughs> um, and I can back this up with some statistics as well. So this bottom survey here. This is uh, a report that was done by PwC on driving social mobility. Um, and this report basically looked at what different groups of people thought were the biggest barriers to them in terms of progression in their career. Um, when they looked at the 55 and overs, it very much came back that they thought skills and education was probably their biggest barrier. But the picture for the 18 to 34 year olds was so, so different. The 18 to 34 year olds, 27% of them thought that their ethnicity was going to be a problem in their career. 27% uh, thought their lack of support network. 24% thought their gender was going to be a barrier to them in their career. 24% thought disability would be a barrier. And 24% thought where they grew up would be a barrier to them. So you can see in the youth and this, you know, these uh, 18 to 34s that we need to attract into the industry, there's a real feeling there that things outside of their control can hamper their professional life. So it's our responsibility in the safety community to make sure that these things are not barriers for them, that these are not things that they think about when they think about the safety industry. And hopefully that will help us bring these fresh talent in, that will help us plug that skills gap, that will help us make the health and safety industry better overall, which 
you know, it's something I'm really, really passionate about. We've come a really long way in the last sort of, you know, decade that I've been involved in the industry, but we, you know, we've still got quite a way to go, I believe. So that very, very quick overview, hopefully gave you an understanding of, you know, what are the actual facts in terms of gender imbalance at the moment um, and why we should care about them. <laughs> So um, what I wanted to go on to next is um, once we realize that there is a gender imbalance in the safety industry, what do we do about that? How are we going to correct that? You know, is that something that we can correct? Um, the good news is it absolutely is. It's definitely something we can fix. So there's a couple of different ways that we can go about this. And the first is by looking at the way that we're hiring when we're bringing people into the safety industry. Obviously, as a recruiter, I'm really passionate about recruitment processes and how we hire. Um, at HSC Recruitment, we are uh, part of Executive Network Group, and we run all of our processes around something called the 3D model, which is basically based around diversity. That's, that's the big thing here. So we've done a lot of research into this, um, and there are a lot of ways that you can come really unstuck <laughs> when, you, when you're trying to hire someone into your company um, that we really need to think about. So... Lots of companies uh, have tried things like, for example, taking names off CVs to try and blank them up so that people can't tell you know, who that person is. It takes out the conscious and unconscious bias. Unfortunately, that probably isn't far enough. There are a lot of things that you can still pick up very easily from a CV, even without a name. So, for example, if you've got, you know, the year you went to school on there, we can probably figure out how old you are. If it's got, you know, uh, the area you live in, we can probably, as a rule, have a guess at what ethnicity you are. Um, even things like the way your CV is written, the language can give away your gender. So if you have a company that genuinely has a bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious, just taking names off CVs isn't going to be enough. We need to do much, much more. Um, so one of the things that uh, HS2 did actually a few years ago, they did a project um, for a couple of their uh, recruitment processes where rather than just doing, you know, a, a blind hire and taking the, C the names off the CVs, they took CVs out of the equation entirely, got rid of the CVs, don't need them. Um, and what they did is they completely looked at competencies instead now, we're very used to seeing competencies in an interview process. You know, how, how have you done this before? How do you do this? Tell me a journey. But they actually put this as the application process. So, for example, if they were looking for a health and safety person that was really good at um, engagement from a culture perspective, that was the question they asked rather than send us your CV. They said, tell us about a time that you've had to engage with people, that you've had to change culture. Tell us how you did that. Um, and from a uh, anecdotal point of view, from the people that I've, I've spoken to over there, the number of diverse hires massively went up through this process. So this, this shows that taking conscious and unconscious bias out of the hiring process can really, really have a big impact. However, there are still hurdles to be faced. Um, I'm not going to just chuck problems at you. I am going to throw solutions at you. But... For example, even though, say, you've worked on your hiring process and you're confident you've taken all the bias out of it, but you're finding that you just aren't getting enough women applying to your jobs, you just can't attract them to the safety industry, they're not interested, they don't want to work with you. Uh, that's quite a common complaint that we hear from people. And the reason for that is we need to look at the sources that we're using and how we're attracting people. Um, so a good example is, say your company only ever... Uh, manages to hire 40 year old white men, but you only ever advertise in The Guardian, you're only ever going to attract a certain type of person to apply for those roles. So it doesn't matter how desperate your HR department are to, you know, make the process more diverse and bring more women into the, to the safety department. It, the chances are that women aren't even finding out about the roles because you're not advertising in the right places, you're not sourcing them from the right places. Um, the final kind of hurdle is now say you've taken the bias out of your process, you have advertised in the right places, um, but you're still not getting diverse applications. Again, something that happens a lot. This absolutely then is tied into the perception of the industry and the company in the marketplace. 
So a good example for that is we often find the construction industry struggles to attract people from LGBTQA. Um, and that's because it sometimes has a perception that it's more of a boys club or maybe the banter level is slightly different from other industries. So perception of industry and company can be a real barrier for you as well. But the good news is we can do stuff about all of this. The biggest hurdle is knowing what the problems are. So if your company is on a path to try and readdress your gender imbalance um, or improve you know, your diversity in, in general, you need to be aware of uh, three main things. Where are you advertising? How are you sourcing people? Is your recruitment process unbiased? And is your perception brand in the marketplace attractive to the people that you're trying to attract? And if you address those three things, you'll find really, really quickly, you'll start to bring more of the people into the industry that you want to bring in. Um, it, it really does have a very, very quick effect. So we've already come quite far on this journey, hopefully this evening, you've learned you know, what the facts are, why we care about it, what we do about that when we're trying to hire people. Um, but you know, ask any woman here or in life in general, and I'm fairly certain at some point during their career journey, there will have been a moment where they have felt um, excluded or overlooked or God forbid, uh, treated like the tea lady when they're actually the most senior person in the meeting. This happens, unfortunately. Um, and almost every woman I know has had an experience like this during their professional career. So we have to make sure that our diversity journey doesn't end at you know, just bringing people into the company. Making a commitment to increasing the numbers of women in industry and doing all this great stuff to attract them in, it, just, it isn't enough. Diversity always has to come along with inclusion, um, which in my mind is probably the more important and more overlooked element of the equation. Um, and in fact, I would also add a, uh, a third um, thing to that equation, which is equity. Um, and I genuinely believe that it's only when a workforce feels included um, and equitable and diverse that then you get that sense of belonging and the culture really, really is where it wants to be. So people sometimes ask about the difference between equity and equality. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. They're, they're, they're similar, but they're not the same thing. So equality is giving everybody the same opportunities, regardless of who they are or what sex they are or what, or what ethnicity they are, you know, that everybody gets the same opportunity. But equity is giving everybody um, the opportunity that they need to succeed, to be on a level playing field. So that might mean giving someone more of a leg up when it comes to work. So for example, um, giving a, a woman who has childcare issues more flexible working hours or making appropriate accommodations for someone with a disability. That's the sort of thing that makes a workplace equitable um, as well as equal. So very similar, but the difference is massively important. And these three things, I think we've got to be getting right if we want to not only bring people into the industry, but keep them in the industry. Um, and weirdly, the pandemic has actually come a really long way in helping us with this. Um, it has made great strides in terms of flexible working. Pandemic, we were having to really, really fight our clients for. You know, if we had women coming to us saying, I love this job, but I can only do four days because of childcare, or, you know, I need to do some work at home because I'm a carer or whatever it was, clients were really, really resistant to that sort of stuff. Um, but because the pandemic kind of forced us into addressing home working and addressing flexible working and all of that, um, and it worked, and, you know, they saw really good results from it, people are so much more open to that now. And hopefully this should allow more women into the workplace or, or more women to return to the workplace. Um, you know, I don't, I don't like to generalize because I know it's not all women, all men, but a lot of the time women do, do bear the brunt of, of child rearing or, you know, if, you're, if your kid's sick, they, they may have to dash out of work or things like that. And oftentimes that has penalized them in the past. And flexible working means that that no longer has to be a detriment to, to us or our careers.
Um, the other good thing is, I mean, there's been a real shift in work-life balance off the back of the pandemic. Most of our clients are really, really addressing that as well. So that's good for everyone, <laughs> not just women. That, that's just a good thing in general. Um, and then finally, the thing I wanted to address, which I think is possibly one of the more interesting bits. Well, hopefully it's all been interesting, but one of the bits that I find interesting um, is the issues that we put on ourselves as women in industry. So a lot of the stuff that I've talked about today um, can be seen, you know, from any diverse background, really. It's applicable to a lot of people. This lapse fit is really very much about women in industry. Um, and there's a very compelling statistic that I come back to quite a lot, which came from a Hewlett Packard um, internal report they did a few years ago that said um, they found men apply for a job when they meet only sort of 60 percent of the criteria. But women only apply when they hit 100 percent of the criteria. And this is something that I've definitely found anecdotally, you know, during my decade in recruitment. All too often when I headhunt people for a role and I'm talking to a, a woman that I think, you know, you'd be brilliant in this role. This is the perfect job for you. Um, they often say, oh, yeah, I saw that job advertised. I thought it was too big for me or I didn't think I was quite qualified or enough or I, I just wasn't sure. Um, so that is not to say that glass ceilings do not exist because they do. Um, but I'm a big believer in uh, the fact that there is also uh, an issue with sticky floor. So sticky floor is um, basically our self-limiting beliefs and assumptions, self-sabotaging behaviours that undermine our career. So things that keep us where we are and stop us from taking that next step or applying for that next role or asking for that raise. Um, and this is a real problem that, that women do have in industry and, and something that I spend a lot of time talking to women about in my day job. Um, but the good news is there's ways around this as well. So the major thing that I advise women in industry is to face your fears. What is the absolute worst thing that could happen if you apply for a job that you're not quite sure is the right thing for you? The absolute worst thing that can happen is that you don't get the job you already didn't have the job. Nothing has changed whatsoever. So really, really want to encourage you to face your fears, put yourself out there um, and, and, you know, try, try and stretch and go for those things that maybe feel a little bit out of reach. Um, you know, what might happen and does often happen is you may get surprised and you get asked along to an interview. And then, you know, you may, again, still not get the job, but you've learned things through that interview process. You've learned what it takes to get to that next step. You've made connections that will, will stick with you for many, many years. Or best case scenario, you do get the job. So there's just absolutely no downside whatsoever in facing your fears and putting yourself forward. Um, I think... When I'm recruiting for a client, and this is something myself and all the team do, we always include a wild card in our shortlist, always. And that is someone that traditionally maybe doesn't meet every exact thing that the client has asked us for. Maybe they don't have the exact right qualification, or maybe they don't have the exact right industry experience, or maybe the client really wanted someone who's been doing it for 10 years and they've only doing it, been doing it for seven but I include them because they've got that something. They've got that X factor. They've got passion. They've got drive. They'd be an excellent cultural fit. So they've got something about them that I think my client would really like and could really, really work with. And you would not believe how many times the wild card gets the job. It happens all the time. So I really want to encourage you to put yourself out there. Um, so that's my first call to action today. Please put yourself out there. Apply for the roles, even when you aren't sure. Um, reach out to hiring managers and recruiters and tell them why you're good, why the role works for you. You never know what could happen. Um, and this is exactly what happened to me when I started out my career. You know, I, I was fresh out of university. I've been doing sort of admin roles for a couple of years and didn't really know what I wanted to do with, with my life. And I saw HSE Recruitment uh, advertising for an experienced consultant. I had absolutely no recruitment experience whatsoever. And uh, my husband talked me into it and uh, convinced me that I'd be good at it. And I, and I sort of gave it a shot. And um, 
you know, it was daunting. Of course it was daunting and it is a scary experience, but I'll forever be grateful that I took that chance because it took my career on such a different path and such a different trajectory. And, you know, here I am 11 years later and I, I run HSC recruitment and I'm an associate director and that would never have happened if I hadn't taken that chance um, and if HSC recruitment hadn't taken the chance on me. So please, please, please put yourselves out there. Um, another tip that I always like to give to women in industry is you've got to put yourself forward and ask for what you want in your current roles. Um, so I think sometimes as women, you know, we've been conditioned to not cause a fuss and to kind of go with the status quo, um, stay in your lane, and it, it absolutely holds us back. So again, not to overgeneralize, I realize this isn't all women, it's not all men, um, but typically what I see as a recruiter is, uh, you know, men just tend to have a lot more faith in themselves, in their roles. You know, they're absolutely more willing, as a rule, to speak to their boss and say to them, I believe I'm being underpaid, I believe I'm being overlooked. Um, and in fact, uh, the BBC did a survey on this a few years ago, and they found that only 32% uh, of women would be comfortable asking for a pay rise in their current role, whereas 51% of men would be comfortable. So again, quite a big disparity between the sexes. And when we look at the safety industry and the fact that, as we you know, saw at the beginning of the, the presentation, that women are underrepresented, underrepresented sorry, at a senior level, um, this is a, a massively important thing for us to address. And I think it really ties in again with my first point about putting yourself out there. You need to take chances and apply for roles, but you need to take chances and back yourself and speak up in your current role. Um, someone once told me that confidence is related to being prepared, which I, I just absolutely love and ha has really stuck with me throughout my career. I think it's really, really powerful and something I wanted to, to sort of pass on to you guys as well. Um, and that will really, really help you if you're in a role and you want to speak up and you want to ask for a pay rise or a promotion or say you're being overlooked, you need to be prepared. You need to know why you are good at your job. What is it that sets you apart, that makes you you, that makes you better than someone else that's doing the role? What makes you an asset to the company? And then you need to go and tell the company, <laughs> which is the scary bit, right? So you might not get that pay rise or that promotion that you want straight away. Um, although you might, never know, it does happen. But at the very least, you have laid your cards on the table um, and your line manager should be able to give you some direction, at least, of what they want from you to get you to that next step, to get you to that next pay rise, to help you on your, your career path. So, yeah. Put yourself out there, be prepared. I sound like the Skypes now. And, um, and then finally, uh, the final sort of tip related to confidence is preparedness. You have to have a career plan. Um, if we want to progress women and get more women in safety into those senior positions, you need to know where you're going and you need to know why. So do you know where you want to be in five years? And do you know where you want to be in 10 years? And once you have that plan, you need to make sure that every single decision that you make in your career leads you to that goal. And this is something I massively learned through, through my time at HZ Recruitment. Um, my boss, when I joined, he was always really, really big on career planning. And so from day one, I knew exactly where I wanted to be by 10 years in that company. I wanted to be running the company. That was the goal. And I knew exactly every single step that I had to take to get to that position in 10 years. Um, don't get me wrong, things will go wrong. <laughs> Your plan will change. Um, you know, what is it they say? Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. You know, that's okay for things to go wrong and things to change. But if you don't have any plan or any career path, that really does hamper us. You know, everybody in industry, but particularly women, because as we've already learned, you know, we are less likely to put ourselves out there. We are less likely to ask for promotions we are more likely to kind of sit back and just go with the flow. So without a clear and consistent career path, it's very, very easy for us to float along um, and just kind of hope that one day someone will notice and someone will reward us. So no more of that. <laughs> so the major message that I would really like um, everybody to sort of take home from, from this today is, if we want more representation of women at a senior level, which hopefully I believe that we do, we have to be visible, 
We have to be prepared and we have to take chances. And if you combine that with all the great work that companies are doing at the moment, you know, addressing the bias in their recruitment uh, processes, <clears throat> that they're doing creating more inclusive spaces and more inclusive and equitable cultures i truly believe there's nothing that can stop us on this journey um so a conclusion women are underrepresented at all levels in the health and safety industry that is a fact currently companies that are more gender balanced or ethnically diverse outperform their competitors and are more likely to be in business in 10 years time again it's just a fact we need to address bias in the recruitment process. We need to look at new ways of hiring. We need to create inclusive and equitable company cultures so that we retain that talent once we actually get hold of it. And we need to stand up and be counted as women in industry. We need to be visible, be prepared, be confident. Um, you know, put yourself forward with your careers. Um, and to finish up, I just thought I'd tell you a, a little uh, story about I spoke at the um, Health and Safety Expo uh, a few years ago, four, four or five years ago now, um, on a very similar topic on you know women in safety and what we can do to kind of propel ourselves. And uh, a lady came up to me afterwards and said, "This is all really really great, but I just don't see anyone that looks like me in my company. I don't have anyone to look up to. You know, I don't have that role model. What do I do?" And my advice was, if you don't see the role model, be the role model. Um, and I've kept in touch with that lady over the last sort of yeah four or five years, and she is an absolute beacon in the safety industry. She is fantastic, um, and I think that's the power of us genuinely believing in ourselves and putting ourselves out there. Um, and I think yeah, the more we discuss this sort of stuff, the more we discuss it with our friendship groups, our companies, our you know local Irish branches. You know, the more we talk about this stuff the more um, progress we can make and the better the health and safety industry is going to be for everybody. Well, that is the hope anyway. So thank you very much. Hopefully you've got some questions for me. <laughs> yeah, I I've think we got... have got some questions. Over to you, Andy, with, with, the, with the questions, please, sorry. Brilliant, thanks, Alan. Uh, yeah, got a good few questions for you, Laura. Um, just to say to everybody, if you have got any more questions, please, please keep them coming. Um, got a few more. Um, so I'll start off, um, Laura, please, um, from um, Gemma Hallifield, um, one of the committee. She said, changing hiring practices is a great idea, but a lot of health and safety people will not have any input into these aspects. Yeah. What could an individual do to help increase diversity and inclusion in the workplace? Yeah, so it's a really, really good question. I think this kind of ties back a lot to what I talk about in terms of, of personal branding. And again, if you know me, you'll have seen me talk about this a lot. Um, I completely agree. If you are not part of the hiring process, it's, it's difficult for you to change that from the inside. But what we can do is make ourselves more visible as women in industry. We can create really, really strong brands around ourselves. We can push ourselves forward on social media. We can speak up at events. We can put videos out there and blogs. We can make sure that we are seen and the world will slowly catch up. The companies will catch up. The cultures will change. The other big thing I would say is if you're in a company where that hiring process isn't right and you know there's bias and you know they're not looking at the right things, I would probably be looking at working somewhere else. It's something that's very, very important to me. And I believe that we have to work for companies that reflect our values and our culture and things that we stand for. And it's one of the big reasons I work for, for HSE and, and ENG. You know, our values are very, very closely aligned. Um, so yeah, it's I, I completely agree. Very difficult to change from the inside, but the more we do, the more we talk about it, the more we push this stuff out there, the world has to catch up. It, you can see that just from the pandemic when the hand has been forced into, you know, flexible working and stuff like that. And then, and it's worked and, you know, the companies haven't collapsed and set on fire and everybody's, you know, still making money, then um, they, they have to just catch up and have to offer it to people. And companies at the moment that haven't caught up and aren't offering flexible working and all that stuff, they can't hire people, they can't retain staff and they, they can't get good hires. So um, yeah, again, be more visible, put yourself out there. Let's create a buzz in the industry and go somewhere where you are valued and where they are thinking about that sort of stuff. And they'll, they'll learn the lesson when they can't hire people. Brilliant, thanks, Laura. Next question then from Alan Dunn, the branch chair. 
he says, what what percentage do you see of women applying for health and safety positions and how do you assess interest in male dominant workplaces? OK, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know an exact percentage, actually. It's, it's something maybe we should look at. Anecdotally, weirdly, after the pandemic, our um, shortlists have been so much more diverse. We've had so much more applications from women, um, you know, BAME community, all of that has really gone through the roof. Um, I don't know the exact reason why we have we are actually doing some research into it at the moment. There are two possible reasons, I think, one that's good and one that's bad. So I think the reasons for that at the moment are either that um, that women and you know ethnic minorities and things like that were maybe the first to lose their jobs in the pandemic that's the 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 bad take on it and maybe that's why there's more around and more sort of applying for things at the moment or the good take is you know after the pandemic because it's changed the way we think about things and it's changed culture clients are more open now to you know to seeing people that are different um they understand that there is a competitive nature in the industry it's really really hard to, to hire good people at the moment and they're opening their eyes a little bit more um but yeah i don't know an exact percentage but yeah anecdotally we're definitely seeing a change over the last 12 18 months it's been it's been quite obvious um and that's across all of us in, in the health and safety community and sorry what was the second part of the question uh, it said, um, how do you assess interest in male dominant workplaces? Um, well, I can tell you what we do from a from a hiring perspective. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you mean. But so with our 3D framework, we collect a lot of data throughout the process. So we're, we're constantly analyzing, you know, what people's backgrounds and, and things like that. And then we look at that data and present it to, to clients. Um, and what we can do is give them, um, say they come to us and say, you know, we're a construction company and we want to hire more women. Can you go and find someone? We'll do the shortlist. We won't put women on the shortlist for the sake of it. We'll give them the best people. But what we'll also give them is a report that says, right, this is who we spoke to. This is how many women are actually in the industry in your area. This is how many were interested in working for you. This is why they weren't. And at least then you can kind of give them that feedback. Um, because that's what's important. If the feedback is, you know, they don't want to work for you because you've, you've not got a great perception for women in the industry, they need to know that. If it's if the feedback is there actually were no women that hit all of your criteria because women in this industry actually go a completely different qualification route, that's also really important feedback for them. So it's, it's um, yeah, it, basically the way we assess it is data. We just collect and collect and collect data and try and give them as much information as possible. You know, it's it's a slow process. We're, we're trying to change the world. It takes a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks, Laura. Another one from uh, Karen Hewitt. She, she's saying she wonders if you've got any stats around women leaving health and safety due to a lack of inclusion and if this might be part of the problem. That's a really good uh, question, Karen. And do you know what? No, I don't. No, it's something we can definitely look into. So, um, Karen, I know I think you spoke to one of the girls in my um, my networks team earlier, Lauren. And uh, so we've got a team in our company that just exists to do research. That's what they're for. So that's why we've got these different stats and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely something we could get them to look into. We're doing a lot on on gender and, and diversity and inclusion, as I mentioned at the moment. So I think it'd be an interesting topic. Um, but no, I don't know that. Sorry, Karen, at the moment. I'm sure uh, we can come back with it with an answer if we, if we get some information on that. Not a problem. <laughs> we can find out. Uh, definitely. Not a problem. Um, so one from James Richardson, then he's, he's asking, um, do you think a job description with a far less focus on technical competency and more focus on attitude and personal values might help attract a more diverse pool of applicants? He says in his experience, the uh, technical sound in JD always attracts the same demographic. 100%. 100% completely agree with you. And it's, it's again, it's something we feed back to clients quite a lot because like I said, you might, with all the will in the world, you might want to hire more women into the industry. But if you've got this big technical spec, it's like they must have this degree, they must have that, they must have this, they must have that. Um, and women just don't go that route. They don't do those qualifications. Then you, you're never going to hire those people. Um, again, from the point we we're talking about, about women applying for jobs and you know only putting themselves forward and they hit 60% of that cr the criteria, that's that's why technical job specs massively put them off and i'm i'm as guilty of it as anyone you know when i was applying to hc recruitment i didn't have any of the technical stuff on there which is why my husband had to talk me into it you know he said but yeah but you can do that job you can do the soft skill side so just chuck your, chuck your name forward um so yeah completely agree the good news is 
the safety industry is going in that direction anyway you know we are having much more of a focus on soft skills on culture on you know that's that side of things which i think is really really important um don't get me wrong we never want to stray away from technical experience entirely we, you know you still need to be qualified you need to know what you're doing but i really like the fact that we are focusing more on on those soft skills now and and um yeah definitely it, it opens it up to a lot more women so yeah. completely agree yeah. So uh, Monica Hastings got a good question. She said, um, the hard hardest bit is getting an interview with a lack of hands-on experience as no one wants to take that on, yeah. um, especially if it's a complete career change for yourself. Mm -hmm. How can you compete with that? It's tough, not going to lie. Health and safety, unfortunately, is one of those Cats 22 industries where, uh, yeah, you, you, you can only get in if you have experience, but they won't let you in without experience. So it's, it's yeah, it's just, it is a tough thing to do. Um, we get asked this question a lot you've got to get some experience so it's thinking creatively about how you do it so what we often recommend is you know obviously do your qualifications make sure you're qualified um, then you can go and you can speak to for example um charities charities often don't have big budgets you know local charity shops and things like that they look for volunteers from a health and safety perspective you can go and do some work there you can speak to people that you know in their companies can you go along and shadow their safety person Things like this, the IOSH branch meetings are invaluable because you've got just a wealth of, of you know, qualified and knowledgeable people at your fingertips here. You can get involved with them, speak to them. I guarantee somebody will allow you to shadow or come on site or help with something to, to get you that sort of hands-on experience. Um, but it is tough, I completely agree. The, what I would say is if you are starting out and you don't have experience, you do have to try that little bit harder when you're applying. It's not good enough to just throw your CV at something. It, it, that's the sort of thing where you probably need to follow up, where you need to try and speak to hiring managers and, and you know explain to them who you are and why you can do this job and why you're so passionate about it. Um, but yeah, it, it's tough, but there are ways around it. And if you want to send me um, an email afterwards, I can, I can try and help and give you a few more pointers. I, sh I should do a, a shameless plug for the IOSH uh, mentoring scheme as well, Monica, yes, if you're not already course. making use of that. Uh, yeah. We have got a really good mentoring scheme, so I encourage you to certainly make. And any of us will happily talk to you about that if you want to, if you want to yeah. take that offline. Yeah, I think the safety community is so helpful. That's what I like about it, and that's um, you know that's changed a lot. It used to be, I know that that there was a lot of silos in safety, and people kind of hung on to the information. And that's just not the case anymore. Everybody is so happy to talk and share, and you know share that innovation and that that best practice. So yeah, absolutely tap into it. Because you're missing a trick if you don't. Good. Brilliant. So I have a question from Gemma Hallifield, um, one of the committee. Um, she's asking, do you believe the old adage that because of bias, a woman has to work twice as effective as a man in order to be considered half as good? Um, I'm not sure if I believe it entirely. Again, it's 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 a little bit anecdotal. It will all massively depend on company culture. Definitely. There, there absolutely will be companies where that's still the case. Like I said, when I was talking about glass ceiling versus sticky floors, there are 100% still companies where there's a glass ceiling and you are going to have to work twice as hard to, to prove yourself. Um, but we are starting to see that change, definitely. So I just think if you are in that situation where you feel you are having to work twice as hard as somebody else to just get recognized because of your gender, you either need to be addressing it straight away with your line manager. And like I said, going in, being prepared, tell them exactly why you do and why you're so great and why you are not prepared to be overlooked anymore. But you, you probably have to be prepared to look at other companies as well. I promise you there are companies out there where you will not be overlooked and you won't have to work twice as hard. It's just a matter of, yeah, I suppose, putting faith in yourself and, and going to find them. Okay. Have you, uh, Karen here, it's asking, have, have you seen any changes in the gender balance applying for health and safety roles since COVID? Yeah, huge. Yeah, absolutely. So as, as I sort of mentioned earlier, we're doing some research into why at the moment, because we're not sure why. But um, yeah, every, every one of us in um, the health and safety team have noticed that our recent applications have been much more gender balanced. Um, like I said, whether that's because women were more likely to lose their jobs during the pandemic, which is the depressing take on it, or whether it's just that, you know, that the pandemic kind of spurred people on and we've got the ability now to have flexible working or work from home and that's giving them opportunities, which hopefully is the, the positive take on it and the one that I like to go with. Um, I mean, every single role that I've worked in the last 12 months, they have been able to offer flexible working 
home working. They've been able to offer things that accommodate different schedules. Um, and that has allowed me to put more women forward. Definitely. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so another one um, from Gemma again. Um, how do we address the conditioning where young girls are taught that they shouldn't make waves? As the mother of uh, an almost teen daughter, the amount of boys that are permitted to do things while she's told um, that in doing the same thing, she uh, she is too much is infuriating. Yeah, so, so, so agree with you. Um, it's really hard that I am not the authority on, <laughs> on feminism. I am a very, very vocal feminist and I, I do like to talk about this. All I can think from that perspective is it, it's a matter of education. Um, you know, I was much more comfortable making waves when I educated myself on why I should be able to make waves. So the more that I read about diversity and inclusion, the more that I read about equality in the, in the workplace, um, the more that I realized that certain things weren't okay, you know, we didn't have to act certain ways just because we were women, the more comfortable I became in then standing up and saying, well, actually, look, we're not gonna take that. Um, so that would probably be my, suggestion is it's just going to come from an education perspective but I completely agree it's it's infuriating I mean I remember I went to um I went to an all-girls school actually um when I was younger and um we still had a dress code <laughs> which I thought was really really crazy where we couldn't show bra straps you know the skirts had to be a certain length um yeah which the only reason I could see for it was the male teachers which just seemed absolutely baffling to me that we had to dress a certain way when there was the, you know, the only men in the school were the teachers. So um, I've always been one to kind of stand up for that sort of stuff. You know, I, I was definitely one that fought for trousers in our school uniform because we weren't allowed to wear them. And then, you know, we, we fought for it and we were allowed to wear them. But the only reason I was comfortable doing that was, yeah, was education and reading about it and knowing why it made sense for me. Hopefully that helps, Gemma. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Th uh, three more questions to go then. Um, so from Sean Cross, um, she, she start, uh, started a uh, career in health and safety and construction back in 2016, um, got a lot of qualifications and experience and then left to try something new. Any advice for getting back into the industry after a few years off? Okay. Um, yeah, again, it's a little bit tough, but it's, it's, it's definitely doable. We see people do this a lot. Um, Again, I, I feel like I repeat myself a lot, but the, all of this stuff is so tied together. The stuff I talk about in, in other um, presentations about personal branding and making sure you've got a strong brand around yourself, that will massively help you. Um, you know, you, you need to show that even though you've not been in the safety industry, you understand it, you're engaged with it, you are passionate, you are driven, you're the sort of person that they want. I would absolutely take someone who'd been out of industry for a couple of years that was passionate and driven and was attending events like this and really, really cared over someone that had been working in safety the whole time but didn't really give a damn about it. So it's about showing that that passion and that drive. Um, there was a really good example of uh, a girl, um, Glesney, I don't know if people saw her on LinkedIn, who was um, quite new to the industry and was trying to get into health and safety. And she created a fantastic brand around herself on social media. And the engagement was incredible. And she had job offers coming out of her ears. <laughs> so I would recommend go and have a look at uh, it's Glesney Half, I think her name was. Hopefully she won't mind me, me mentioning her. But go and have a look at her on LinkedIn and see what she did in terms of, you know, building that, that sort of brand around herself. But um, yeah, you just need to make sure that you are engaged doing things like this, you know, you're working on your CPD, you are up to date on all legislation, you're up to date on everything that's happening and you're out there talking to people, showing your knowledge. Um, because when I um, when I recruit for a client, you know, I get a CV from someone that I, I go then check their LinkedIn, I go check, are they involved in any IOSH groups? I, you know, we always do a little bit of digging and the people that we're interested in are the people that are engaged in industry and are, are out there and, and, you know, doing exciting things. Thank you. Don't forget as well, if, if um, anyone that, that missed Laura's excellent presentation she did last year on personal branding, it is still, the recording is um, on our branch page as well. So anyone that wants to go back and watch that, it is still there. Um, so Daniel Gillard, uh, sorry, Dan, apologies, Danielle Gillard um, um, says that 28 years old and um, been doing health and safety for almost nine years and feels, and I feel like I'm at a brick wall in my current company in terms of learning and development professional development and promotion and being respected at a higher level. 
what advice would you give to myself and others in my scenario trying to push uh, make myself seen in the company and become better suited to the company or focus on finding a better company suited to me yeah well that well that was going to be the first bit was you know it's not necessarily about the focus on fitting into the company maybe it's about you finding the company that's better suited for you so absolutely that would be something i'd advise you know we start looking at options for you um, the thing i was talking about at the end where i was talking about confidence is preparedness that's the big key for me you need to be so so prepared and know what you can offer inside and out so if someone comes to you and says you know what is it that makes you great why are you so good you can tell them you know you've got a list as long as you're on well this is what i do this is what i do these are my achievements these are the sort of stuff that will make you stand out. I completely get that after sort of nine years, you do you do sometimes hit a wall. And sometimes, if I'm honest, the only way around that is to move companies. Sometimes that is the only way. But definitely, I would be making sure you understand your value, why you are an asset to that company, why they would want you over anybody else in the marketplace. And I'd be letting them know those things i know that's really scary to do and it doesn't have to be done in a confrontational way this isn't you going and saying right i'm the shit and you better recognize it or i'm going to leave it's not that at all it's just sitting down and having a conversation with a line manager and saying look i'm this is the way i'm feeling and i just um i just want to talk to you about it and know okay is there a next step for me here is there something i can do is there progression um and yeah because more times than not they they don't realize you're feeling that way and they'll they'll want to help you and they'll want to give you that support but if they don't then yeah it, it may just be time to, to have a look around and, and see what else is out there for you brilliant thank you so i've got another question um it's the last one i've got on here now from um, Rosilla, one of the committee um she says how how can you get com companies to commit to embrace diversity and proactively attract women and keep them in senior safety roles okay it's a tough one. You need to be, um, you need to be, well, I was going to say making a stink, but maybe not making a stink. You, you need to be addressing this again. You know, I think sometimes um, they maybe don't realise that there's an issue. They don't realise there's a gender imbalance. They don't realise that this is the way that people are thinking. And unless we tell them, you know, you can't be mad at someone for the way they deal with something if you've never explained to them how you would like them to deal with it. You know, they, if they have, you know, those boundaries and they understand what you want and then they're still doing something else, fair enough. But oftentimes they just, you know, they haven't realised that there's a problem. It, so I would be addressing that first, maybe just, again, trying to speak, sit down, speak to people and say, look, you know, we, we think there's an issue here. And, and it's something that... Um, you know, we, we've had to do in, in our own careers, even at, at HSC recruitment. And, and um, you know, I remember back in the day, recruitment was really, really male dominated. There were just, there weren't many women there, although we, we probably outnumber them quite a lot now. Um, but back in the day, yeah, there just, there just really wasn't. And we did have to sit down and have those conversations and say, look, you know, we think the culture's kind of, it, it, it's going in the wrong direction here. You know, we need to do something about this. And management were completely open to it. They didn't realize we were feeling that way. They didn't know there was a problem once they did we could start putting steps in place to do something about it um but again it's just one of those you're not you, you're not going to get through to everyone and if if they're not interested then i do encourage you to look for someone who is because there are people out there but yeah hopefully that helps again if you want to come and talk to me and, and we can have a more in-depth conversation about your specifics then <laughs> then please do get in touch bro well, thank you laura i think that's all of our questions so um is there anything else to add? I'll hand you back over to the chair. All right. Thank you very much, Andy, for asking the questions. And thank you, Laura, even more so for answering the questions. Uh, good variety of questions there. I've, I've got to say, uh, there was a lot, of, lot that I've learned from this and taking it forward. And I'm sure there's a lot that uh, our members here have taken back with them and uh, sort of inspired a lot of thoughts moving forwards, both for the male and the female species, I think, going forward. In, in challenging um, our, our bosses. Uh, I particularly like, uh, and I thought was really interesting, was your, um, your wildcard thinking. And I, I think that would be great if that was adopted across more recruitment organisation and, and, and bosses throughout the, uh, throughout the world, in fact. So um, that's great. There's a lot of information there. Excellent presentation again. Uh, and I love your passion and drive, and I'm sure that'll be rubbing off on, on all of us as well. So 
A massive thank you, Laura. Um, we can tell it was of interest because of the number of um, questions that came up with the audience. And, um, you know, there was only a couple that left. So that shows how interested and engaging, again, you were. So thanks very much. It's been great to have you on board again. And um, for our members, please, a big thank you. Keep your eye open for the mailers moving forward. And um, LinkedIn and Twitter for any other events that's coming up in the very near future. So just be mindful of that. And once again, thank you for this. And don't forget um, all good information for your CPD moving forward. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, good to see you. Take care and stay safe. And if the committee could please just hang over for 10 minutes for a bit of a debrief and a bit, bit of a chat, that would be greatly appreciated from me. Um, quite happy for you to stay over if you want to, Laura, for five or 10 minutes. If you wish, it'd be good to just have a chat with you. Thank you.